There's always been interest by, by players and bassists, I think, but I think the biggest change is, is, is the interest from the composers. Yeah. All the composers today are really, really interested in working together with players and creating new stuff. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath. So glad to have you here today. And visit our site at ContrabassConversations.com for details about everything that's going on here. And I'd love to hear from you. Send me a message at feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. Let me know a little bit about yourself. And I know you're going to enjoy today's episode featuring Dan Stife. Dan is co-principal bassist in the Oslo Philharmonic, and he's also professor at the Norwegian Academy of Music. He is such an active musician internationally. He's a prolific solo player. He's released seven solo albums in the past 11 years. And I had a chance to spend some time with Dan at Bass 2016 in Prague, and it was such a pleasure to get to know him in person. He's a wonderful person, great player, and he's doing amazing things for the double bass. And we dig into all kinds of topics, like Dan growing up way out in the woods in Sweden, his new album, which has recordings of pieces from Simo Garcia, Teppo Hau to Aho, and Bernard Sa. We talk about Dan's time studying with Gary Carr in America and his new solo album, which he just recorded and is coming out in March. And you're going to be hearing several excerpts throughout the episode from Dan's most recently released album, Octophania. And you can get a link to this in the show notes. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Diderio Strings, and let you know a little bit about their Helicore Strings, which are multi-stranded steel core strings. They're designed, engineered, manufactured in New York, in the USA, at the Diderio String Factory. You can get them in orchestral, hybrid, pizzicato, and solo string sets. And hosting for Contrabass Conversations is provided by Bass Capos. And bass Capos are a great choice for any bass player looking to implement a double bass extension. They're easy to install and adjust. They're cheaper and more reliable than hand-built latches. And they're light and quick to execute. And you can learn more at BassCapos.com. So here we go with our conversation featuring Dan Stife. <laughs> Good evening. How's how's it going? It's been a very busy fall, but it's going it's going great. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds busy. Wow. I mean, it's it's been fun following along on Facebook. I mean, that's it's crazy. You're all over the place. It's been going on. It's, it's been great. It's fantastic, but it's been it's been a lot of a lot of a lot of traveling, a lot of recording, a lot of work. But it's fun. It's fantastic. Yeah. Is this all going into a new album? Is this one specific recording project you're working on, or? This weekend, I, I recorded a new CD for a label I never worked with before. It's, it's a British label called Prima Fascia, who, is, mm-hmm. who asked me if I could do a uh, CD. If I, if I, I'm the, the, the owner of that label is a jazz, British jazz pianist. Okay. Who is called uh, Steve Plus, and he asked me if I could do some, some recording. I worked with him before as a, as a producer on other, on other stuff. And um, so he came over, and we spent Friday, Saturday doing a recording of a new of a new city. Nice. And were you recording in in Oslo, or where where was it taking place? We used one of the concert halls in, at my academy. He came with his microphones and cables, and uh, <laughs> we had a very nice day. Oh, that's great! That's great! I can't wait to check it out. When when it, do you have a release date kind of in mind, or what's? He doesn't know exactly, but he thinks late March. Late March. Okay. And that's, I mean, that's fast. Normally, it normally takes quite a lot longer than that from, from getting the recording done until it's out. So he's working fast. Yeah, no kidding. What were the sessions like? Did you do just like two incredibly long days or did you break it up? How did, how did that all go? We, we did like two sessions each day. Okay. The first one was probably like three, two times three hours. And the second one was a bit faster. So it's it like four sessions. And we had one. We had one extra day available if if we needed it, but it turned out that it was okay without it. What all did you record? I, I saw that the Simon Garcia piece, right? I saw that post on Facebook about that. But what what, what else did you do? Uh, I did two two pieces by Simon. Okay. And then I did um, Teppo Hautaho, our Finnish friend. He also wrote a, a, a piece for me, a solo piece. I did that, and I did 
Um, Bernard Sall, uh-huh. French guy who wrote a solo sonata, also for me, in three movements. I did that. And there's a British composer called John Alexander, who also written some solo stuff. Then I have two new Norwegian, quite new Norwegian composers that, that are not really well known at all outside Norway. So, so they are also have some solo pieces. Oh, nice. Nice. And the last stuff was the producer, the pianist, he also writes the music. So we, we did some duos, bass, piano together. What, was any of this music that you played on your recital in Prague, or is this all, have I not heard any of this? Yes, it was uh, the Simo, one of Simons. Okay. And Tepos, and one movement from Bernard Sal and John Alexander. So half of the program almost was done in Prague. Yeah, I love what I've heard of Bernard Sal. The, the, he, didn't he do those miniatures that you recorded? What, the Portraits for Friends? Is that what it is? Yeah, Portraits for Friends. He did. When I, when I recorded them, he had four books, uh, and that was 28 small short pieces. Now he has come with two more books. So, so, but that was after I did the recording. So I did the 28 first, which are, it was a big project. It was, some were crazy difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and some were just beautiful melodic stuff. So, so he tried, he tried to portrait all this double bass friends around the world. Yeah. Well, it's, what, it's such a fantastic collection. The, the ones that I've heard, because they're so different in styles. I mean, that it, it, were they really, could you really, like the people that you knew, could you really hear like their playing or their composition in the yeah, portrait? Really, I, I think Bernard really, really hit it quite right on. At least, I mean, I, I knew, I know maybe a little more than half of them. And, and people like Thierry and Catalin and, and, and Puccini and, and, Ettore, all those were really, they hit, hit it right on the, on the nail. Fantastic. You've done three other soul albums, is that right, before this? The one I recorded now, this weekend, is number seven. Is number seven? Oh, really? Wow. When did it, when was your first solo album? Oh, I don't remember exact year, but it's going to be like uh, 11, 12 years ago. I think. Really? Okay. And then, then the plan, I mean, it was only planned maybe to do one and that was that was it but the, the the label i normally do stuff for in norway is has been very generous and very interested in in, in doing more and which is not very common these days so they still have some more plans so we'll see it might be might even come some more okay that's so exciting yeah and it what a cool what a cool development in your career that must be i mean like seven albums in the in 11 years that's an incredible output Plus, there's some some more recordings. We also have there's a new downloading company on the internet from Norway called um, uh, Contra Classics. A friend of mine owns that and runs it, so I've done some some recordings with that too as well on the side. So I'm lucky. I'm in, I'm in a good spot where where I can just almost record and put out what I want. Yeah, almost. <laughs> <laughs> had you always been has had solo music always been that big a focus for you through your whole career or is that something that sort of ramped up the last few years it's been going in, in periods when i when i when i studied in america i studied with gary mm-hmm. uh, of course then then also solo playing was very important and i really worked a lot on it but then for a few years when i got the principal job in the first principal job in the orchestra in, in oslo i had Two principal jobs: one in the Norwegian Chamber Orchestra and one in the the opera. And of course, that that was the two first orchestra jobs I've had, so it took a lot of time, especially the opera opera one, because it was repertoire that I really didn't know at all before. Yeah. So, so the first years there, most less solo playing, but but the interest interest was still there, but it was just a matter of priority what had to be done. Yeah. And uh, but then when when I started to get in contact with this recording company, in, you know, they and they wanted it, of course, it came it came back to get that. Well, it just seems like such an exciting time to be involved with solo bass or bass in general, but solo bass. And it's just so cool, like going to Prague and seeing all these composers. And I'd met a few of them in person. I'd heard of the names, but it's just phenomenal to me how many people are active out there right now. It seems like it's exponential. Like every year there's more and more. Have you noticed a change? Yeah, it's more and more. And the biggest change, there's always been interest by, by players and bassists, I think, but 
I think the biggest change is, is, is the interest from the composers. Yeah. Because they, they really they really have realized the potential of that of that instrument and what it can do. So a lot of of the composers today are really, really interested in working together with players and and, and creating new stuff, and it, which is fantastic. Well, the, the there is, uh, and if I butcher people's names, I, I apologize. My, uh, but is it Rolf Martinson? Is that uh, okay? So that piece, you got a clip of it on on your website, and boy, the orchestration. I mean, that is just a phenomenal. It's just like texturally such a rich piece. It's fantastic. He he really did a great job, and and um, it worked. It's one of those pieces that he we recorded it on the on, when we did the premiere with my orchestra. We recorded it live. And he used a full symphony orchestra, eight basses and, and a full string section. And, but the orchestration is so great that it really, it really worked in the hall as well. No, 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 no problem. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. I was curious, like if, in terms of balance or anything like that, anything you had to do or it was just composed in a way that, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, he also, I have a, I have to say, I also have a fantastic instrument. It's, it's a wonderful old Gaspar da Solo and, and Rolf knew that instrument. And so, so the concerto was written for both for me and for that bass. So, so he he knew how that bass worked in the hall and, and what he could do. So, so of course that also helped a lot. When did you start playing that bass? When did that come into your uh, your hands? Uh, I was approached by it's owned by um, a fund, foundation, a bank foundation in Norway called Dexter Music, and approached me and, and asked if I would be interested in in playing an old Italian instrument. And up till then, I never really had. I, I only always had contemporary modern made instruments. And that was, this was maybe also 13, 14 years ago. And we looked for a while. There's a guy in, in Holland who, who has a lot of contacts. So he put together a, a collection of maybe 10, 12 old bases. And we, we spent some days trying. And, and this one was fantastic. Talk about an amazing instrument. Like that's like what, what the, you know, you can count on one, one or two hands, the amount of bass, you know, of that kind of pedigree. Did, did that, do you feel like that changed your playing at all when you got on a bass like that? Like just the way you thought about sound or, or just bass in general? Oh yeah, completely. It, it, it really, it's an, an old instrument like that is, first of all, it can't be played in any, any way you want. It sort of, it, it has its way that it wants you. Uh, so you, yeah, I had to sort of change my playing into a suit to that instrument, and and also inside that instrument there are so many colors and and and, and ways of playing that that you, I couldn't do with a modern in, contemporary instrument before. So so it it really changed. But that that's happened when this foundation has brought many instruments to Norway and brought it in, and, and I hear the same change in many of the other players too that when they've been working on an instrument for some years it's it's really developed and changed the playing amazing how how does it work uh in terms of like like in oslo uh, or or the other orchestras you played in i know in germany it's fairly typical for an orchestra to like own a set of instruments that you play on is that how it is that how, the traditional setup in norway or do players bring their own instruments how does that work generally the orchestras own the, the, the instrument. Okay. But uh, some are good, some are not so good. I mean, of course, it's expensive to own nine, ten bases. It's, it's everyone is not in the same level. But I'm, I'm, I'm lucky there too because uh, I don't use a Gasparo in the in the um, orchestra normally. I do if it's a big solo or or like that. But otherwise, I have a another Italian from 1750 around that's owned by a. But that one is owned by a private investor, but he lends to the orchestra. So the, so the orchestra can use it. So the day I, if I, if, you, if I quit the orchestra, that that day stays with the orchestra yeah. for the next one.
Well, I'd love to know because like it's just I mean, it's remarkable to me the amount like just putting this album together and then you've got the orchestra job and and you're you're so active traveling. How, how do you balance just generally like keeping up your technique, practicing solo repertoire uh, practicing what you need to for the orchestra. Like what is, what, what is a, there's probably no typical day in the life for you, but if there is like, what, what does a day of practicing look like for you? Well, it's first of all, the, the amount of practicing <laughs> has gone down a lot in, in the amount of minutes and hours, because first of all, one probably learns how to practice. So, so you don't need as many hours with instruments, maybe as you did 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, but, but, of course, some days it's not enough because I have a full-time job in the Oslo Philharmonic and I also have a 60% job in as a professor at the academy. Uh, and, and doing that and doing the solo stuff on the side, it's, it's, you really have to be very, be very efficient when you practice, you know what to work on and, and have a plan, not, not just sit and play. Yeah. yeah. And also it helps a lot that my orchestra has, um, they're very good at giving free. If if I have a project or if I have a travel or if I have something, they 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 realize it's important and 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 they give they give me time to do most things that that. I- now, in terms of your early, so I, so I know you ended up studying with Gary Carr for a while in the states, but maybe take us back to your early years on the bass or even just in music. Like, how did you get started in music? Well, where, where I come from in Sweden, I come from. Um, Way on, out in the woods, out in the country. There's no classical music around at all. So, so the beginning was just electric bass and, and dance bands and rock and jazz and, and that was a meaning to, that was my plan. I was going to end up in Stockholm playing electric bass and do studio jobs. So that was the, the goal. But then, then I, when I, when I was uh, 17, 18, I got into a music school and they did not have a, electric bass teacher, but they had a double bass teacher. And I thought that, okay, I can do that for a year or two and <laughs> learn music and learn the notes and learn how to, but he was so fantastic that, that after one year with him, it was, there was no way back. So, so that, that did it. His way of being passionate about the bass and, and the music was well, I, I've got to ask, and and you know where I come, I come from a an area of the United States, huge number of Swedish and Norwegian uh, immigrants, and where I grew up, the Swedes and the Norwegians did not get along. There was that was a big, <laughs> big, you know, and and I'm Polish, so I stayed out of the fray. But but <laughs> but is is that rival? And here you are, uh, originally from Sweden, but working your career in Norway. Is that yeah. rivalry just something we have here in the states, or is that what? <laughs> well, it's, it's I mean, of course, it's rivalry, but but it's it, it's not maybe as serious as it seems sometimes. <laughs> but it's of course when, especially like in sports and stuff, it, uh-huh. it's it's very important who's winning. That okay. the winner is coming from the right country. Okay, got so it. I'm, I'm, I'm still very sweet, much Swedish when it comes to uh, that part. I, it doesn't change even if I lived I've lived longer in Norway than I did in, than I had in Sweden, but that doesn't change. Now, in terms of in terms of teaching, you know, your position and, and working with the students, what are there any and every student's so different, but, but but are there any materials you like to work out of? Like, do you like belay, semandal? Is there any any sort of preferred technical foundation you like to give students? I sort of I sort of I don't use a certain school of my own. My 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 teacher in Oslo who had the job before me. His name was Knut Gittler. He made a sort of school of his own, which is partly based on what Gary is doing and, and partly other things. So uh, a lot of what I do, I've picked up from Knut to start with. But then w- what I use teaching now is I pick material here and there, which I think works and which I think uh, helps the students and, and that they also work together. So I have some stuff from... From Gary, I have some stuff from Bradetich, I have some stuff from Kutkut, and I have some stuff from Rabat, and, and I'm trying to make, make this into something that I can stand for, and I, I, I think it's the results that uh, I think the student needs.
you typically uh, sit when you play? I think I I remember that. Is that is that standard for you? Yeah, most of the time I have. It's 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 um, well, starting with Gary, we also all stood and we played both German and French and tried different things. But basically, it's it's always been felt more. Um, well, I, I felt that I could do my things better sitting. Uh, not worrying about the balance or get easy get the sound I want and, and it's it's of course I, I can stand and play and I do that sometimes too but when it really comes down to, to more difficult stuff or, or, or recitals I, I normally sit the okay. whole time okay okay uh, and then in terms of, and I'm just I'm so unfamiliar with any traditions in Norway whatsoever except my own experience in you know growing up in the US uh, it is is French bow more predominant in Norway or German bow, or is it kind of a mix like other areas? What's, what's, what do you see? When I came, when I came to Norway first time, started studying it, both Sweden and Norway what was were really French bow, French Italian bow uh, territory. Uh, and almost no one, but then over the years it, it started uh, to change. So, so, uh, it's still maybe it's more French than, than German, but but many people are also playing German, and many of the students are also playing German, and also in the orchestras now. So it's it's a mix that that especially now since since Europe has changed so much this last year, said so that we get the, we get people from all over the place, both in the academy and and in the orchestras in, in Scandinavia. So so. We have a happy mix. How have, just in general, since you've been working in Norway for a while, how has the orchestra landscape or, or the university, how, what's changed over the last few decades? Uh, that just, uh, that's a real broad question, but just uh, what have you noticed cause there, uh, over, over the last few years changing? Well, well, first of all, it's become much more international. It, it's, when I came in, it was almost only Scandinavians that, that, that was here. So of course, all the all the influences people bring into the country, of course, it also changes both students and orchestras and everything. So it's gotten much more interna- international. And some of, in some of the orchestras in Norway, half the half the players are are non Norwegians. So yeah, they come from all over the place. There's quite a lot of Americans in in, in places in Norway too, and and. The level of playing also among the students have gotten so much higher that it is, it's probably has all over the place today. So it's probably not something special from, from Scandinavia, but I, I think just the, the, the rise of the level the whole time on the base has been incredible the last year. Well, I've always been curious about that because I, I know several Americans that are in, I know a couple that are in Gothenburg, I know in Sweden, and it's, it's always seemed to me like those, the, both Sweden and Norway seem to be fairly open to international players. There's a pretty pretty international mix in your orchestra? Yeah, it is. And it, it's, now we've never really been part of this. I know there's been some rivalry between French and German ball when Stuff like that. We've never really been part of it, but we, we sort of tried to. First of all, I think it's because Sweden, at least Norway especially, does not have this long, long tradition that many of the Euro- Central European countries do, like Austria, Vienna, and Berlin, and all that. That has hundreds of years of uh, tradition. Norway is a young country. It got it became an own country very late, and it doesn't have. It hasn't had time yet to big up that build up that tradition that many other countries have. So it's, it's become more like a, a melting pot of, of influences from, from all over the place. I love, now you've gone and performed at International Society of Bassists in the past, haven't you? The, yeah. when, when was the last time you were over for that? Was it the previous last one? Year. Last year. Okay. okay. Yeah, I've been on at least four of them. So. Play, playing recitals or just attending or? Recitals and also some of my... European and American friends have played, so we we do the chamber music and yeah. do this sitting in some of the juries, and it's been it's been fun. Yeah, it's got to be such, uh, and it's it's challenging even to go from where you are to Prague, and then to go from where you are to Colorado or anything like that. I mean, it's such a sacrifice and such a challenge, but. It's got to be worth it for you to, since you do it over and over again. Like, what what do you find satisfying about those events? Well, it's 
in, it's many things. Partly, it's, it's first of all, of course, it's very nice just to meet friends and and mm -hmm. to play with friends and 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 do chamber music with them. Yeah. Um, meet composers and meet bass makers. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, you learn a lot from from doing the both this ISB and the bass Europe things. It's been it's been great, and I going to Ithaca now in June coming up. So it's um, I don't what was what has changed is that. I don't travel as much with the Gaspar as I did because there, there was a there was a uh, accident in in traveling to when I came back from San Francisco convention there was a stopover changeover in New York Newark and it had an accident with the base and made a big hole in it. Oh. After that, it, it they had taken it out of the case and and security inspected the case. And had a mis mishap with it. So after that, um, the owners say that I can travel, but they would rather I don't have too many change of flights. As long as it's a non-stop flight, they consider it to be safer. But of course, you you never know. So the last the last conventions I've been borrowing borrowing instruments, playing on. So were, so were you borrowing an instrument when you were in Prague? Yes. Yeah. So how do you play at that level? I mean, you're such a fabulous player. And like, like, I wasn't sure if that was a bass that you were just that another bass of yours. It didn't look like the Gasparo, but like, how do you adjust so quickly to, to play on these foreign instruments? I mean, bass, that's such a challenge. It is. Well, in a way, I've been lucky because it's, it's for the last three, four years, I've been playing sometimes the same instrument, sometimes different instruments, but it's, it's been the same maker almost the whole time. There's an Italian bass maker called Scipione, Cristiano Scipione, who goes to many of these conventions. And he often brings two or three basses to, to show and to... Um, and and he's, he's been letting me use his instruments. So, of course, they're all different, but, but you get to know more or less what his building and what his instruments are like. So, so um, I've been very happy. Of course, I would have loved to bring the Gasparo all over the place, but not not doing that. I'm, I've been very happy to to play his instruments for the last years. Yeah, yeah. Well, an instrument like Gas Gasparo. It's understandable that you'd be <laughs> nervous about traveling with something like that. Oh, yeah. It's 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 it was very nerve wracking to get the instrument to begin with. It was I hardly dared to take it out the door, but. You learn how to live with it. Now you you do a lot of teaching and 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 master classes and those kind of events, and so you you you, ru you spend a lot of time working with younger bass players. And I'm just curious, uh, what do you see younger players struggling with the most? Maybe in terms of technique, left hand, right hand, expressiveness. Are there anything any things you just kind of notice? We have a lot of students that listen to this podcast, so it's it, people always are curious about that. Well, for for me. The most important part of playing for me is the sound. I think that every person has more or less a personal sound. Maybe you haven't. Maybe people haven't found it yet, or or maybe they're not looking for it. And I think that for for me, many many of players maybe get too hung up in and interested in technical fast fingers fast playing and take so which is, I mean it's fun it's great it's very understandable and, and I, I just hope that those players also get in as interested in, in sound and production and, and find it, their own personal sound as as I've gotten over the years yeah Sounds sound is such a hard thing to practice. You know, I have I have a couple of adult students here in San Francisco and we were talking about sound and just like I, I was trying to play in recordings or like play a certain different sound. And it's it's so tricky because like the left hand is so much more objective, right? You're you're on the first finger on the second finger, you're on the third finger. But then the right hand, it's it's kind of like a paintbrush. I mean, do you have any do you have any exercises you give people to work on sound or that? This is something that I always find so challenging to work on. 
No, I, I, I have to say, I, I learned a lot about this sound stuff being with those years with Gary. Mm, mm-hmm. I learned a lot of, of, of that helped me about playing with weight, yeah. relax weight as much as possible. I think I was a much more physical player before in a way that I was using much more muscle and, and not really relaxed mm-hmm. right arm. Working with him over that for some years with, with weight and, and points of contacts and speed of the bow and, and, and changing that over the years, I think that was the biggest influence on what changed me in, in, when it comes to, to, to sound and color. Do, do you uh, do you recommend Gary's vomit exercises or his you know shifting exercises? Is that a is that a big thing for you? I use it to my students all the time, especially those vomit things, especially the, those people who who stand and play balance, pace, and big shifts, and, and especially that. Is, I mean, it's really helpful for 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 the players. Yeah, it's almost like it's a balance and right hand exercise more than a left hand exercise. You think it's a left hand because you see the movement, but yeah, it's very good for the right hand as well. Well, I've got I've got one more question for you, and I and I love it's it was so fun to talk with with you and Gabrielle and, and and Alberto and and any anytime you got anything coming up, you know, I'd I'd love to hop on and and chat. But I and this is kind of a broad question, but uh, and you've done so much in your career. I mean, you've been successful in so many ways and as a recording artist and and playing in all these ensembles and if you could just go back in time and give like 18 year old dan some advice now knowing what you know now do you have any advice that you give him i wish the biggest thing is that i wish i'd been more open when i was younger more open to different influences yeah i think i was i think i was more in a way narrow-minded and and Mm -hmm. thought i had more of the answers than that I maybe didn't have. Mm-hmm. So, so if I could have just made myself open to other people's influences and, and made myself more open, then I think it could have been even better and even more fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's just amazing to watch what you're doing. It seems like you're, you're getting even more active with every year, you know, so it's There's very a new base, a new bass concerto coming soon. It's a, a Swedish guy who started writing it. Really? Yes, it's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. Dan, so great to catch up with you. And folks, check out everything that he's doing at danstife.com. And that is going to do it for another episode of Contrabass Conversations. So great to have you here today. And if you haven't picked up your copy of the Double Bass Quotes book yet, go to ContrabassConversations.com slash quotes to get your copy. It's filled with great and inspiring words of wisdom from past podcast guests. And I'd love it if you picked up your free copy. Thanks so much for tuning in. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Uh-huh.